This class is in memory of Jared Orchen, and today we will learn Parshat Metzora. The Parsha will be, we, will, we, we started to talk about it last week, and we, we talked about, we talked about the story of Tzoraas. What is Tzoraas? The word Tzoraas comes from the word Tzoraas. <laughs> then Tzoraz was a leprosy was a biblical punishment for anything that God did not like people to do doesn't make a difference what it was not like everybody thinks only for Loshan Ora you're right, it's written in the Bible clearly more when Miriam spoke about Moses even it wasn't just a pure Loshan Ora still she spoke about Moses but as we spoke last week, the story, we mentioned the story of Naaman, the leader of the army, the head of the army of Aram. Aram was the strongest army in the Middle East, in Damascus, in, in Syria. And he attacked the Jewish people. And he, had, and, he came, and, he, and he took, as a prisoner of war, one goal, Jewish goal. And for this, God punished them with Tzoraz. He got, he got leprosy. This girl told him, go to Israel, there is a prophet. He will go and he will cure you. He went to the prophet. The prophet cured him. And then he offered the prophet money. And the prophet told him, no, I don't want to take money. It's a miracle from God. And he left. But then what happened? Hmm. The prophet's secretary, Gabai Gehazi, run after Naaman, and he told them, my rabbi changed his mind, mm -hmm. the prophet changed his mind. And he took from my money, the gifts and everything, whatever he had done. Mm -hmm. He came back. Elisha told them, Elisha didn't, he didn't need information, Elisha was a prophet, he told them, ah, you took the money, right? Even, it was an embarrassment to God. The prophet says, no, then the prophet changed his mind. He told them, the leprosy of Naaman should move to you. And he and his three sons became leper. There is another story we mentioned last week about Cain. Cain killed Abel. God tells Cain, anybody who will kill you, I'll kill him. I'll punish him. Nobody should touch you. Why is God protecting Cain so much? Cain killed Abel. He should be killed. Why is he protected? Then the Medrash says something amazing. Cain told God, God, I beat up my brother, but I never saw people die. I told him, Abel, get up. What are you pretending here? I didn't want to get up. Cain never knew what means killing, that we cannot punish him for killing. Therefore, anybody who will kill Cain will be punished. That God made a sign on Cain's forehead that nobody should kill him. That the message said, what's the sign? The sign is leprosy, Tzoraz. Then it was basically a sign to say that he didn't do something good. And the other one to protect them from the that the old Tzoraz was a something an outside to bring out your bad behavior. You know, inside nobody knows what's going on. When, you, when, when, it's, when it's outside, then people know it's bringing it out. And then there is a story about another king, Uziyahu. Uziyahu was a king in the time of the first temple. That to be a king for him was not enough. He decided he needs more than being a king. What he needs more than being a king, he wants to be a high priest. He went to the temple, and he was about to enter the temple. The, the high priest told them, enough that you have your kingdom. The job in the temple is for the sons, for the descendants of Aaron, the high priest. It's not your place. He had a pen in his hand. He picked it up the pen. He wanted to hit the coin. I think the high priest wanted, wanted to stop him. That moment, the Tzoraz, the leprosy, showed up on his forehead. 
and he was taken away from there to quarantine. That was the end of his kingdom either, too. Not only wasn't I priest, he wasn't a king either. Gurnished. That means to say that Soraz was for everything. But everything from God, from God has a purpose. It's for the sake of good. God is the ultimate good. Not just good, the ultimate good. There is two levels. There is one level to believe that God, whatever is happens to in my life is from God. That's one thing. That's believing in God. Then there is trusting God. What's the difference? You know, I remember once the Rebbe gave somebody, the Rebbe used to give out dollars for charity. Once a great, a big rabbi from Israel passed by, the Rebbe gave him a dollar and he told him, it's written on this, in God we trust. Then he, the guy moved on. <coughs> the Rebbe called him back and told him, and you know the difference between belief and trust is from one end to the other. What is to believe? To believe is, yeah, everything happened to me is from God. But that's not good. In God we trust means I trust my wife and my children. That whatever will happen, she will do the best. Just as I will try to do the best, I trust her 100%. That's trust. That I trust that this person will do the best. Trusting God means that whatever happens is the best. So not every time we understand it, but that's, that's what trusting God is. Then let's try to understand what's the whole business of leprosy. But Phil will look what type of leprosy we have in these two parshas. This parsha is Metzora. Last week we learned Parshas Tazria. Then we'll just look at the titles to understand we had three types of leprosy. In the beginning of Parshas Tazria, I would say from page 91, the law starts the laws of Tzaras. There is about skin, skin Tzaras. Somebody who has it on his body. Spot, you lock him up, you unlock him up. You, the coin has to look of it. Why the coin? The coin had to be the one to pronounce if the person is pure or impure. Even if the coin was not a professional in the laws of Tsaras, and yet another rabbi you tell them this is good and this is not, the coin had to be the one who actually says it. When the coin said that Tsaras, it became Tsaras. When the coin did not say Tsaras, it wasn't Tsaras. Why you needed a coin? Because the coin in spirituality, coin is Isha Chesed. Coin is kindness. To pronounce somebody impure, we need a very kind person to do it. Because we want somebody who will find any way, shape, or form. Maybe, maybe, maybe we can keep it pure. Maybe it's not so bad. And only when the coin he says it, then we'll, then, and also the coin alone by seeing it, if the coin is a holy man, it might kind of elevate the person, cure the problem. Then this is the first Torahs. Then, in the middle of last week's parashas, last week's parashas, we read about Torahs, um, of garment, on page 103, on page 103, we read about Torahs of garment. Let's read just a few lines just to get into the mood of this, and then we'll, we'll move on. Laws of Saras of Garment. If a garment has a Saras lesion on it, be it woolen garment or a linen garment, or on threads prepared for the warp or wool woof of linen or wool, or on leather or anything made from leather, if the lesion on the garment, the leather, the warp, or the woof threads, or the various types of leather articles is deep green or deep red, it is a lesion of saras, and it should be shown to the Corn. priest. Yeah. The priest should examine the lesion and should quarantine the article with the lesion for seven days. On, on the seventh day, he should examine the lesion. If the lesion has spread on the garment or on the warp or the woof, or on the leather, for whatever purpose the leather had been made, the lesion is piercing Zaris, 
and is richly impure. He must burn the garment, the warp or the woof, or the wool or linen, or the leather article which has the lesion upon it, for it is pierced in Zaras and it should be burned in fire. Okay, then what are you learning about Zaras of clothing? In the olden days, people did not have clothing, didn't buy, didn't change the clothing three times a day like today. For this event, we put on this. Then he's going walking out, he puts on this. Then he's going for dinner, he puts this. Then he takes a shower between one and dime and the other. Okay, God bless them. Um, you were wearing a suit for your wedding, and you wore it for your son's wedding. I mean, how, how much clothing is people in biblical time especially? Then Tzoras and your clothing was a big deal. Then if it's, if, if, it's, if it's a leprosy, you have to burn the clothing. If it's not leprosy, you keep it. Then again, went through the whole process. He checked it, he locked it up, and he checked, and he cleaned, and he this. And if it was not good, it was burned. That's Tzoras and clothing. This week's Parsha, on page 117, in Parsha's Metzairo, we read about Tzoras and houses. Leprosy that showed up and now on walls, like a mold. Mm -hmm. There is there is mold on your skin, there is mold on your clothing, and there is mold on your walls. Now, would it go from like body to uh, clothing to the house, like worse, or just it oh. could be the house, or it could be the body, or it could oh. be. Oh, oh, we'll get there, we'll get there, okay. we'll get there. Very good, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the question is by people, what is worse? What's more important to you, your finger or your house? Some people will quicker give a finger for charity than the money, the wrong finger. Some people will, give, will donate a kidney before they'll donate $10,000. There is such people. Some people will quicker give the money than the, than, than the kidney. But <laughs> the same thing is here. But let's first read a little bit about the Tzoraos of the houses. Want to read? God spoke to Moshe and to Aaron, saying, When you come to the land of Canaan, which I am giving you as your possession, and I placed Tzoraos lesions on houses in the land of the Amorites, which the children of Ruvain and God will choose to possess, the owner of the house should inform the priest, saying, There appears to me to be something like a Tsaras lesion in my house. Okay. Upon, the priest's, go ahead, go ahead. upon the priest's instructions, they should clear out the house before the priest comes to inspect the lesion, so that every earthenware vessel in the house should not become irreversibly ritually impure if the priest pronounces the house ritually impure. Now, what is happening? You come to the coin, you say, You know, I just have something on my walls. He tells you, before I'm coming, clean up the house. Because the moment the coin comes and pronounce the, the house, that this is to us, everything inside the house becomes impure. Then to save the Jew the trouble, the, the Torah says, you first clean up the whole house. Then the coin will come. It's interesting, in these laws, there is, for example, if it's a, if it's a guy who just got married, in the seven days of his, of his Shever Baches, of his celebration, after the wedding, the coin doesn't 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 see doesn't see is is a say, wait until the shevet boches is over. Then we we'll look at us. We try also during the holidays, during Pesach, during Sukkot. You don't look, you don't pronounce anybody impure during these times, because you don't want because you don't want to disturb the holiday or their celebration. The same thing in the house. Now the town, Rashi points out from this. The vessels become impure. Most of the vessels we travel in the mikveh, we immerse them in the water, and they become pure again. Which vessels cannot be uh, 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 um, pure again in the mikveh? Earth, earth will, I mean, like uh, made out of clay. The cheapest vessels, really, at that time. Then the Torah points out, as she says, look how much God has mercy on Jewish money. And money in general, not to spend money. If, it's, if, if, you can, if there is a way to save the vessels from becoming pure, even it's very cheap vessels, and person say, who cares? No, no such thing as who cares. If it's a vessel, if it's good, we have to purify it. Then the, the, uh, you, you can, if you can save it, do it. Then first you have to take everything out from the house, then the coin will come to the house. Go ahead. Afterwards, Afterwards the priest should come to inspect the house. He should inspect the lesion. 
and if the lesion in the walls of the house consists of dark green or dark red sunken looking stains appearing as if they are deeper than the wall, then the priest should go outside the house to the entrance of the house and he should quarantine the house for seven days. The priest should return on the seventh day. If he sees that the lesion has spread in the walls of the house, then the priest should instruct that they remove the stones which the lesion is on and they should cast them away outside the city to a ritually impure place. You have to take out the whole spot of the, of the, of the, of the stain and get it out. Re, 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 rebuild the wall. Take it all out and clean it up if it's impure. If it's not impure, then, then it's okay. If it's not true, you can like it up for another week and so on and on. Then what's going on here? We have, like you said, we have tzoras on the houses, tzoras on the clothing, tzoras on the skin. Now tzoras is for bad behavior. If it's lotion or uh, if it's other bad things, whatever God doesn't like a little bit, sends a little tzoras in the mail. <laughs> what is going on? God, God's punishment are not for punishment are for a way to correct the person's life. It's not a punishment. It's showing them the way to remind them to go back to the right way. A person speaks Lashon Hara. God wants to send them a message. He starts with the houses, with the most outside for of the thing away from them. It's called in the Kabbalah language, Maki Farachok. It's around you, but it's not attached to you. He sees Tzoras and the house. Okay, he calls the coin. The call gives him a good look in his eyes, says, you know, Bachar, you better fix your way. Obviously, you know, I have nothing to, I'm nothing against you, and I love you, and I never heard you speaking Lashonara, but obviously, if you're a little you better check your pickle, you know, it's like, a, see what's going on. Make an inventory on your spirituality. Okay. He takes out everything, and oh, it all goes through this whole nightmare. By that time, he's already doing tshuva, believe me, just to clean up. He has to call a moving company. <laughs> And they take everything out from his house. It's not a joke. He leave it outside in the front lawn. Where is he going to put everything? For seven days. He got the message. God bless him. The Tzoraz disappears. Everything is good. He doesn't get a message. He gets a big hole in his house. Fine. And he has to re 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 rebuild his house. He didn't get the message. It appears in his clothing. And his suit. His tie, his shirt. He goes around, people tell him, I think it's Tzoraz, you know? You better check it with the coin. <laughs> You're already embarrassed to show up in the same suit in, in Shul tomorrow. <laughs> people tell him, no, huh, it's Tzoraz, you know, I'd just like to point you out all the wrongdoings of somebody else. It's a Jewish um, sport or sickness. I know what to call it. Jews like to correct each other. They love it, no matter what type of religion, of uh, denomination they are. They love to show somebody else that he knows less than them. It's one of the biggest enjoyment of Jews. You know, you shouldn't move the, you shouldn't end over the, you know, by the funerals, they call the, what it's called, they dirt, call, the dirt, the, the, the shovel. You, should, you, should, you shouldn't end over the shovel. Every time somebody tells me at the funeral, this guy's ending over the shop, you know, it's not allowed. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell him, if he, I think to myself, I can tell you a few things that you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Jewish sport. Let's put it in a nice way. Then, that's under clothing. If he gets a message, if not, it burns the clothing. If he doesn't get the message, then it shows up on his skin. Why is it reversed in the, in the Torah? Mm -hmm. should not they start with the skin. The Torah Shalom. tells you Shalom. the Torah tells you how bad it could get right away. I don't know. But in reality, know. it went from step to step, the Talmud says. That. Yes. <laughs> now, what reminds me, it's, what does this mean? God, it's not a punishment. God is trying to show the, bring the person back to his right place, to, his, to the right way, to the right path. There is a story like this about the Alter Rebbe. The Alter Rebbe, the first Chabad Rebbe Shneur Zaman of Liadi, was arrested in Russia. It was a, 
other Jews informed them to the government. Other religious Jews. There was a big fight, Hasidim and not Hasidim. Finally, they came to arrest him. First of all, the first time when he came, he left. He, ro- he ran away. And they came, they said, they, they told his wife, where is, where is your husband? She says, he's not here. They got, and he told them, we'll come back, basically. We can. He came home at night. And then he, one of his Hasidim came to, one of his closest Hasidim came to visit him. He says, and his name was Rabbi Shmuel Monkes. He told him, Shmuel, should I go with him? Because the Rebbe is an holy man, he can, he can make it work, he shouldn't have to go with them. He told them like this, if you're not, if you're, if you're a Rebbe, what are you afraid of them? And if you're not a Rebbe, why you took away from all of us the enjoyment of the physical world? <laughs> you tell us we have to control ourselves and we have to do this. And you took from us all the enjoyment of the material world and you're not even a Rebbe? What is this? And if you're a holy man, God will protect you. In any case, he decided to go. They arrested him Thursday night. And the big, it was a big wagon, a black wagon for the worst enemies of the government. People who are trying to make a revolution against the Tsar. The Tsar was paranoid, he was afraid of revolutions. It was Friday afternoon, Friday noon, and the Alter Rebbe tells the driver, the, mm-hmm. the officer who owned the whole thing, it was, with, it was a whole entourage. They came to arrest such an important person. He tells them, please stop for Shabbos, I don't want to drive. He tells them, you probably don't understand who you're doing here. You think, you think you're the Rebbe, you are a prisoner, we are taking you, we are the bosses. Sure. One of the axles of the, of the wagon box, he sent to the closest town, took a few hours, they came, they fixed, you know, in the olden days, everything took forever. They drive a little further, one of the horses dies. <laughs> They changed the nose, took also off your house. It was a whole Friday, it was a whole thing. They drive a little further, the horses got into fear, they didn't want to move. He turns to the Rebbe, says, Rebbe, can we at least go to the narrow, to the, to the, to the closest village? Oh, no, can we get off the road? He says, yeah, you can go off the road. They, they rested, they didn't drive on Shabbos. Was it a punishment? What's the punishment? We try to leave you a message in your answering machine. You don't get it? Axel breaks down. Okay, I hope you got it. You don't get it? One of the horses that died. You don't get it again? Something? Oh, good morning. If you would remember, if you woke, woke up yourself at the first time, you wouldn't have to go all the way this long, long road. That was, that was, that's an example for Tzorahs. That's the best example for Tzorahs. God is trying to tell us how to correct ourselves. And... That's what, that's the order it used to go. Now, what's interesting about, this is only to learn that it's, it's a punishment for a good purpose, so to speak. But if you believe that there is good in everything, there is, must be a good thing in the Tzoraz. In the Tzoraz itself must be something good. Especially in the Tzoraz of the houses. Uh-huh. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about the houses. Let's go to page back 117, and we'll read the classic question. Now, before we go there, it was another explanation from a Talmudic statement in Masechet Yuma. Why, why God gave a person so ras of the house, right? You had to take everything out of the house, right? The Talmud says like this, something amazing. I come to bow for Mr. Bay. Maybe you have a video camera. I am my child. We have, a, we have a party. I want to video him. Maybe I have a, Oh, I would really want to help you, but I don't have my camera. It's broken. Oh, I don't have oh, I lost it. But next day you come, maybe you have a, you know, to all the lawn, you have a machine, to clean the walls. No, I don't have no, 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 no. Shine. God says you're on the road, on the way of not, not giving anything to anyone. He says, you know what? We'll teach him a lesson, this boy. He sends you to the house of the house. You have to take everything out of the house, right? Oh, look at the cameras that he has, this guy. <laughs> look what he has. He has the best and the nicest. He said he doesn't have anything. <laughs> Can you imagine the embarrassment? 
And then this guy put everything out. That the whole idea of the Tzoraz is to put everything out. He's trying to cover up. The same thing with I didn't speak, you know. Now in the thought backs and, and, and the comments on the internet, people write, they don't have to say who they are. But believe me, the government knows exactly who you are. <laughs> they know from which, which computer it's coming. And it, it's covered up. You think it's covered up. And then the calls come, comes out. And, then, and, and that's what it is. But it's another reason for the punishment of Tzarat, not necessarily for Loshonora, but just for somebody who doesn't want to be any kind, who doesn't want to bow, uh, lend things to others, who doesn't want to help others. He wants, every, he wants to take from others what he needs, but he never wants to reciprocate. And in general, it's not about just reciprocating, it's about being kind. Then comes another reason for Tzorah. Now comes a positive reason for Tzorah. Till here we had negative. It's like and correcting people. But could be it's a positive. You see, in God's punishment, the negative could turn into a positive the same moment. Will we see it? We see it now. Everybody saw the movie Noah, Noah, Noah. No, no, you didn't see, see it. No. Don't waste your money. I didn't see it either. But all the report, I heard it. So. A disaster. A, fail, a big failure. In any case, in the, the real story of Noah, God told him he'll give them a float, right? The first seven days, it was raining. If they would repent, if they would do tshuva, the water would turn into rain water of blessing. That the same water, if you turn on the, the faucet a little stronger, it becomes flood. But it gives you time. The seven days it was raining, raining stronger, stronger. But it's still, you can still reverse it. Then in many cases, when a person is doing tshuva, you can reverse the situation. Not only the punishment will go away, you discover that it's a blessing in disguise that was the biggest, the best thing that ever happened to you. Not in everything in life is like this, but in some things. For example, the Tzoraz of the house. Now we'll read the classic question. Why did God promise to bring Tzoraz? It is good news for them that Tzoraz lesions are to come upon them. Throughout the entire 40 years that the Jewish people were in the desert, the Amorites had hidden away treasures of gold inside the walls of their houses. And as a result of the Tzoraz lesion, a person would demolish his house and find them. Oh, that's oh. a nice treasure. You're sitting on a treasure and you don't even know... You're sitting in a, literally, you're sitting in a treasure. The people who were before you, I did everything in the walls, and they disappeared. You come into a house, you conquer the city, you, can, you, get, you set yourself in the house, you're sitting in a treasure, and I mean, that was a story not long ago, I mean, that was a little different, of the guy who bought a, a desk, an mm -hmm. office desk and Craigslist in Connecticut. He came home, he couldn't enter, he couldn't bring in the, the, the desk was too wide for the door. He had to undo it, to take it apart. He finds that behind the door was hidden a bag of $100,000 in $100 bills. Nineteen, nine, Nice. He was a religious boy, and he said, this is not my money. He called this woman that he bought it from her, she was an elderly woman, that was her, her husband passed away, that was her old treasure. And she forgot that you put it there. And she sold them for $200 there mm -hmm. in the, the desk. And he gave them back the money. Many cases, people sit on such treasures, they don't even know who left it there. <coughs> Let's say he would come to a house with furniture and it's a Ford, Ford, uh, I mean, apartment building that people change. You have the money, you don't even know who it is. Sometimes there was an Israeli woman who claimed that she threw away a mattress and was full of dollars, and she forgot that they, the whole country was looking, nobody found it. I don't know if it was true, maybe it was never done, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody found it, took it home, who knows? Then sometimes a person is sitting in a house, is sitting in a treasure, does not know that God sent Saras. Now, it could be he sent Saras just to, give, just to make him <coughs> remove the house, but even if he sent Saras to him because he spoke Loshonora, the guy did tshuva that actually from the bad thing came out something very good. And it came out from this that he found the treasure. That's, that's what the, uh, the Rashi brings. And the Medrash elaborates on that. Let's read what the Medrash says. Why was it good news? 
Why was it good news? What that you realize that the Medrash doesn't say it, I'm sorry. I just have to finish mine. The Medrash doesn't say it about Tzoras of, of skin. Because about persons, pe personal suffering, we don't say, oh, there is a good thing about it. But about money suffering, that's what he said. Money loss, houses, clothing, that's the thing that we say, oh, you have to do tshuva, you have to do this. Mm. When it comes to life, that's above us. That's, we don't understand why God is doing it. God is his own, his own long calculation and long history, and it's, all, it's much bigger than us. Even in the Talmud that's written, then the discussion is that somebody, when somebody loses money, there is a Talmudic story that they tell them, oh, you have to do tshuva, it's a message from God. When somebody, when it's coming to life issues, then there was never this discussion there. Even in the story of Job, the friends of Job tells them, you have to do tshuva. And he says, no, I'm, I'm okay. And God agrees with Job. That God tells, God tells Job, basically he says, that you understand creation, that you understand what's behind everything, that you know this, and goes all in a very poetic way, that you understand how this works, and how this works. I don't remember the old expressions, because I don't learn job too much. But, but the idea is, when it comes to life, it's a whole different story, and it's important to notice. Now we'll read the message. I'm sorry, go back. Why was it good news that Sarah's legends were so come up on them? Rabbi Shimon for Yoha taught, when the Canaanites heard that the Jewish people were approaching, they went about hiding their valuables in their houses and fields. What did God do? He plugged the Jewish person's house with Sarah's, and when he demolished it, he would find treasure in it. Does that mean to say that somebody came and told the Canaanites that the Jewish people were entering the land? Rabbi Ishmael ben Nachman said, Yes, Yeshua sent them three letters, saying, Whoever wishes to live, let him live. Whoever wishes to make peace, let him make peace. Whoever wishes to wage war, let him wage war. It means to say that the Jewish people, the Canaanites, before he came to, he came, Joshua came to conquer the land, he gave them the option to live, doesn't want to kill them, it doesn't want to hurt them. Anybody wants to leave, everyone wants to make peace and accept the seven Noahide laws can even stay in Israel. He didn't even have to leave. And whoever wants to war, they can go to war. That the people who didn't want to leave or people who run away, they knew in advance. Therefore they were putting it in the walls and they say and they and they and they saved it. Then when the Torah came, when the Jewish people came, in many cases they had plenty of houses. Now there is another explanation from another rabbi. The Ralbag, he lived, I think, in Spain. He says something very interesting. You know, from time to time, we have earthquakes. Nebach. Earthquake is a terrible thing. I mean, there you were know, well, earthquakes in Israel, in Tzfat, were well, a few times, big earthquakes. Even now, there is from time to time, lately, there were a few mild earthquakes in Israel. And the Israeli buildings are really not up to code when it comes to these things, especially the elderly buildings. And there are many, many buildings, God forbid, I mean, it will never happen, but it, Israel, it, every, every 500 years or so, there was an earthquake. If you, even in, in, in you go to Caesarea, you see how buildings are laying on top of each other. Mm -hmm. You see the walls are, this is not, that was not built like this. That's a house that collapsed. And it's, you can see how it's like, and now they're building it up of it, a store, a restaurant, and they're making it nice. But the way the building is, that was not, you don't build a building like this. It was one on top of the other. Then the Ralbach says, the Jewish people came to housing, to houses, and they, and they were sitting in a very weak home, that the home has, can collapse. And God wants to save the Jew from going into, from that the home should collapse on them. What is he doing? He's sending Tzora Asani Aos. And by this, he calls the Kohen, and the Kohen tells him, yes, Tzora and he moves everything out, and he destroys the house because this wall or this house is not safe enough. Then what looks to this guy, oy vey, I lost my house. It was five minutes before, before an earthquake, and God saved his life. 
because if he would stay in the house, he would be got from Beit Unos with that. Did the did the uh, uh, Canaanites think by putting the, their treasures in the walls that they will that come they back? Would be coming back? Yeah, they thought, oh, these uh, the Jewish people are here for a short time. We will conquer back. We will make it. Look, in 1948 also, I was the going to say the right of return. The, yeah, the yeah, Arab countries, told, you know, most of the Arabs <clears throat> left Israel in 1948, not because they just chased them out, because the Arab countries told them, you move out of the way, we will come with the armies, we'll conquer the land, and then you'll come back and you'll get the Jewish home too. That was the motivation. That was so many homes were available, were empty, in so many Arabs, all this, 90% of the refugees left on their own before the Jews came. And because they were sure they would come back. Never, the plan didn't work out. And they end up to, to be refugees until today, some of them. But it's all become, the same thing happened in the time of the Bible. The people who left or run away or fought, they were sure they will come back. You know, I mean, on the other hand, even Jews during the Holocaust. Not long ago, they found in Czechoslovakia a burial, a treasure of... Um, uh, candlesticks and crowns of Torahs, all silver uh, Kiddush cups and all these things that somebody who was probably was a businessman and he, I, he, he buried it with the, with the hope that he will come back to take it and maybe even he survived but he moved on to America he didn't think about going back to Czechoslovakia to look for his uh, silver and just I think five, six years ago they found a huge treasure I think it was Czechoslovakia of, of uh, they, they were building a building and they digged out and they found it. Then we it happened to the Jewish people too. I mean, never. I mean, when you run away from your home, you believe, you hope that you'll come back, right? That it goes both ways. Then that's the other, that's the two positive reasons for, for uh, Tzoraz. For Tzoraz of the houses, you realize we are not looking for positive reasons for when somebody dies, God forbid, or somebody has Tzoraz on his skin. We're looking for the house. Because when it's something about money, we say that could be a good reason there. And we find and they all because God wants to save him from an earthquake, or God wants to find him find a treasure. But it's also a lot about perspective, how we look at things. Two people can look at the same thing. I mean, one will see the positive side in it, one person will see the negative side in it. That's the Tsoras of the house. That's that's the last piece of Tsoras that we have in, in this portion. I just have, I'm just going to make yes. a comment. You, tell yes. me. you know, you read the first one is Tazria, the first parasha. That it's, Tazria. Tazria. Yeah. And then this one. In Metzora. And, and it's, there's, there's just so much, especially on the skin, about the blotches and this, the, the hairs, and it goes on. And I mean, not, I'm sure that means something, <laughs> but it's hard to read. Or understand or, or keep it in your mind. I mean, is, is there some, something more to it than what you just told us? For well, not to speak Lush, you know, it's all about it. I mean, it all comes from irrigant. It's written that the way to atone for the Tzoraz is to take uh, the, the ingredients are to remind us of not being irrigant. It all comes from selfishness and arrogance, that you think that you are more important than the others. And, and for bringing, what, what, what is Lashon Hora? Separating between husband and wife, between friends, right? Then the Torah will, do, will go to great length because the idea of unity is the foundation, foundation of our nation. Every time if something goes wrong, it's usually because it was a fight. How did Jewish people end up in, in, in Egypt? What was the cause for ending Yosef. up in England? Yeah. A fight in the family. Simple. The brothers were fighting. We paid a big bill for this. 210 years slavery. All the Tzoraz getting got it to come and make miracles. Oh, yo, 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 to save us. We messed it up. What happened? What caused the destruction of the first temple? The zealots fighting with each other. That wasn't That's the second time. That's the second time. Was, what was caused the idol. first temple. I don't know sure. No. Yeah. I know. That's what's written. But what really yeah. could? It's a Where was the beginning of the end of the first temple? It's the uh, first temple. It's Nebuchadnezzar. Um, yeah. Where was the beginning of the end? 
Oh, so how many years was it there? 300 and some years. The temple was standing for 410 years. Mm-hmm. When was the beginning of the end? The beginning of the demise of Ju- the Jewish people in the land of Israel. That, that the led eventually. between Judea and Israel. Yeah. Very good. Right up. So Solomon just built a temple five minutes ago. Yeah. His son already separated two kingdoms. That was the beginning of them. Those two kingdoms. That means you're not united. That means the, 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 the enemies, Assyrian king came and conquered piece by piece, piece by piece. And, be, and, the, and these guys worshipped idols. They didn't want them to go to the temple of Jerusalem. They closed the ways. They made them worship idols. That the beginning of the end was the separation was the war between the two groups. And then is the second temple. What does the, the second temple? It was a fight between the, the two Maccabee, but the two brothers of the, of the Maccabees, Aristobulus and this, and the guy, one was in Jerusalem, one was out in Jerusalem, and they were killing each other. And the guy who was outside of Jerusalem invited the Romans to join him to help him the fight against the other one. And that's how the Romans didn't dare to come to, to, to take control over Israel, but the Jews invited them. Again, it was a fight, and the fight brought to the destruction. Wherever you put a finger, wherever there is a destruction of the Jewish people, it all comes because there is a fight within the Jews. You look, the rest of the world doesn't pressure us to give up on the world, the Western world. Nobody, nobody even demands such a thing. You know why? Because all the Jews are united that this belongs to, Israel, to the Jews. Anything goes where there is a, half of, a big part, part of the Jewish people. So, oh, let's make concessions. Let's give them this. Let's give them this. Let's give them this. Ever these concessions, there is a few Jews who let it in. Then the, rest of, then the enemies jump in. Whatever there is unity, nobody can stop. There is an amazing story. You know, there is a story... Happened, I think, 700 years ago in Paris. <coughs> they burned the Talmud. The government collected 20 or 24 crates, big um, crates of Talmud, trucks of Talmud, of Talmudic books from all the yeshivas. They burned in public all the books on a Friday. It was, I think, in June or something like this. There is, in there, when you go in Paris, you see, I think it's even written there, that this is the place where they burned the, the Talmud. It was so bad that all the yeshivas had moved out of France because there was no books. You cannot learn without books. It was a terrible thing. What caused it? You'll not believe it. <coughs> right after my Maimonides passed away, it started a big movement within the Jewish people against Maimonides. That he doesn't believe in life after that. He doesn't believe in this. He found stories. Maimonides, that today is the most, the most accepted authority in the Jewish people, was, uh, I think, 100 years after he, dies, he died. They, there was a huge war against them. That these people mm-hmm. were fighting the books of Maimonides and the people learned this, encouraged the church to go into Jewish homes and to look where there is Maimonides in this book and to collect them and to burn it. The Jewish people <coughs> used the authorities to force the Jews to give up on the book of Maimonides. Lo and behold, they saw they can do it, right? The second step was that the Jewish people did it themselves. That the, that the government did it for all the Jewish books. For them, there is no difference between Maimonides, not Maimonides, this, this. People, try to be, people don't realize that, you know, oh, this is, these Jews are doing it. We are the nice guys. In the eyes of the world, you are all the same. If you allow them to attack th- these people, eventually they come to attack you. That every time in Jewish history, whenever there was a destruction, it was because it was a lack of unity. That's why the laws of Tazria and Metzera are so relevant and so important to understand that whenever there is, there is a lack of unity, there is all the Tzoros come. That's why Tzoros and Tzoras are the same word. Mm-hmm. If you don't want Tzoros, you don't have Tzoros, you don't speak, you don't speak Lashon Or any type of fighting and infighting and talking about others and so on. And nowadays, do we have a Tzoros? No. Tzoros was a biblical punishment in the time of the Bible. Today, no, but now. Today we do not have this type of 
Leprosy we do not have today. Do no. you know a Jew na last name Soros? Oh, that's a different thing. Yeah, that's the story with no, 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 Sam no, no, Soros. No, 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 no. Oh, yeah, he's bad. That's a different story. He is he's actually, his name is Soros. There was a very righteous man with yeah. the name Reblade Soros. Not Soros, Soros. Mm -hmm. From the name Sarah. Mm -hmm. Sarah. Mm -hmm. And he was, uh, I think, the uh, uh, grandson of the Baal Shem Tov. Or, and, uh, and, he, and, he, and he was, and this Soros, Soros is a descendant of him. Mm -hmm. Talking about George? Talking about George yeah, Soros? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And George Soros? The oh, billionaire yeah, 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 yeah. George Soros is the same. Yeah. Yeah. Baal Shem Tov? I think from the Baal Shem Tov. Reblaib Soros, yeah. Did you really imagine how much really? destruction yes, he does? Yes, yes, yes. How much what? He might have so like destruction. Karl, Karl Marx, uh, Soros does? He's bad, yeah. Orthodox I haven't right heard him in years, but I've heard him a lot yeah. before. Yeah. yeah. He's still yeah. around then, huh? Oh, he's horrible. That's the point is, I'll tell you something. No. Okay. Unity now. Unity, people. <laughs> in life, God rewards for every good that we do. Now, sometimes you get it. Sometimes your grandchild gets it. Sometimes your great grandchild gets it. That maybe John Solace is being rewarded for a blade Solace. Why is he rewarded? That's God's calculation. We don't know. Or there is, it's much bigger, that's what I'm saying. It's, the picture is so bigger that we're only trying to understand why this guy, this guy is bad, this guy is good. We cannot even make, pass this judgment. You know, it's written about God. We have to learn, we have to go in God's ways, right? Then what is written in the Medrash? God is merciful, you be merciful. God is kind, you be kind. God dressed the naked like he dressed Adam and Eve, you dress the naked. God was a, 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 a fed, fed uh, hungry. God gave us manna, so you'd be. It's not written in the Medrash. God is judging, you judge. God is punishing, you punish. It's not written in the Medrash. It means to say, we shouldn't try to be like God and these things, because we don't understand and we don't know. We have to do what we, what we know, and the rest we should leave to God. And that's an important thing to remember. And that's why if, guy, if a person has a, You need to understand there is a Talmudic statement, Rebbe Mechabed Ashirim. Rebbe, the author of the Mishnah, his name was Rabbi Yudah the Prince. He was a very rich man himself. And he used to honor rich people. He had a big yeshiva. He wrote down the, the Mishnah. He wrote down the beginning of the Talmud was written down by him. He, he made a revolution in Jewish history. Because until then, the oral tradition was never written. And he started to write it down. And Rebbe was a, he honored rich people. But the question is, why should he honor rich? First of all, he was rich himself, what he needs the rich people. And besides, he should honor the scholars. Why should he honor the rich? It's insulting, oh, only the rich, what did the poor, what did the scholars, what did this? The Rebbe spoke a few times about it. The Rebbe said something very interesting. God created the world of rich and poor, purposely. Why? Because God wants, wants a world of give and take. God doesn't want a world of only everybody should, have, should live for himself. God wants kindness. The give and take should move on. And therefore, he created rich and poor, purposely. Communism didn't work. They tried to make everybody equal. They made everybody poor, right? It didn't work. It collapsed in every country. It will collapse forever because it's against the will of God. That was not God's agenda. Now, God trusts some people to give them money, because he trusted them that they will know what to do with the money. Now, they have free choice. But God trusted them. God didn't trust me, obviously. There's something good about them better than me, right? He trusted them, right? Then instead of serving and saying, oh, the rich go, oh, 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 we say the rich go to heaven. The rich, now, he didn't honor people who give charity. That's everybody honors. He, he honored rich people even if they don't give. Because if God trusted them with money, obviously there is something special about them. I don't know if I would pass the test. God gave them because they have the potential. Sometimes they pass the test to give it out. Sometimes they don't. Look, the richest people in the world give so much. Bill Gates and this day have there is institutions and, and funds and this and I'm sure that uh, George Soros gives also a lot of charity. Mm -hmm. What I mean to say is there is a story about the 
fifth Chabad, the fourth Chabad Rebbe, the Rebbe Marash, it was, it was a pogrom in Russia, a few pogroms. And the pogroms in the Shtetlach, the people after the pogroms were left with nothing, because usually a pogrom, besides killing a few people, they destroyed everything and they robbed and they took every, all, everything from, the Jews were literally were without a roof under it. The, the Rebbe Marash went to St. Petersburg and made a meeting of all the rich people. And he asked them to give money to be, a star, to be able to save the people on the streets. They're starving there. They're in freezing. And you know, they were like not, they were hesitating to be generous. They told them like, oh, when it comes to go to the government, you don't ask our opinion. You go yourself and you talk to the, now you need our help. Oh, now, we, now we're here. The, the Rebbe told them like this. He told them there is a prayer in the, in, the, in the book of Psalms. There is a prayer that starts with the word Tfilah Le'ani, the prayer for the poor man. There is a Tfilah Le'Moshe, a prayer for Moses. There is Tfilah Le'David, a prayer for David. There is Tfilah Le'Ani, a prayer for the poor man. The Rebbe tells him, what is, what, is the, what's the poor, what is the poor man praying? He tells him, I'll tell you what he's praying. He tells him, you know, God created rich and poor, right? Because he wants kindness. He wants giving and taking. You know what the poor man prays? He says, God, I know you need rich and poor, but why me? <laughs> <laughs> give me the money. I'll do much better with it. Mm -hmm. I'll be the rich and give the poor. Then the Rebbe continued and told them, guys, God, from time to time, is checking the inventory to see maybe the poor man is right. Let's check. If the poor that I entrusted with the money, my treasures, treasurers, if they do with the money what they're supposed to do or not. If not, maybe I'll give it to somebody else. And that now it's your choice if you want to be on this side of the, of the, of the coin or on the other side. Everybody gave very generously <laughs> after that. <Not> check. <laughs> you know, giving and taking is a blessing that God created. Many times people complain Oh, my child from college, he only calls and he needs money. Know what I tell him? Thank God that you give money, you have money to give him. If not, he would never call you. Mm -hmm. Why should a 20-year-old boy call a 50-year-old man or 60-year-old man? Well, what have you <laughs> Thank God, it's a give and take. It's all our life is like this. All our life is, that's all about relationships. <clears throat> One of the biggest problems in, the Israel, in Israel is that the rabbis are being paid by the government. You go to a government agency. They are not in a rush to serve you. Why? Because they will not make more money if they serve you. You don't pay them. They're not taking us. They don't care. Mm -hmm. If they would get money from you, it would be a give and take. Mm -hmm would be a relationship. There is no give and take. Mm -hmm. That's the problem with every government agency in the world. Because the, it's the same thing as with the medical world, and whatever it is, the moment I do not, you from serving you, I'm not, you, I'm not getting, I'm only giving, I'm not getting anything from you, so to speak. Then why should I, why should I give an effort? In Israel, the rabbis are not appointed by the, by the communities. They get money from, they get a salary from the government, what they care. You come to my class, but if not, not, have a nice day. Okay. Life is a give and take. That's how God created the world. Chesed ve'emes, that's what that's written in, in the book of Psalms, Chesed God created the world of givers and takers. And that's what it's all about.